Friends, welcome to another midweek Lenten reflection with us at Bethlehem. It is a joy to walk this Lenten journey with you to the cross and to the empty tomb. As we continue this week, uh, I would encourage you to set aside this time, these few minutes, as sacred for you in your relationship with Jesus. If you have some way to mark that or to to crowd out some of the, the distractions and the noise that so frequently occupies our lives, I would encourage you to do that. Something I like to do personally is to light a candle just to set the scene for myself and have a reminder that Jesus is the light of the world. So if you have a, a candle and would like to use it, I would encourage you hit pause right now and uh, go set the, uh, the scene for yourself to make this a meditative, contemplative, devotional time for you in your relationship with Jesus. As we begin, we call upon God's name, the name that he has placed upon us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, you are the Lord of time and seasons, we ask that you would make this time holy, that you would come to us in your word and revive us by your spirit. As we make this Lenten journey toward the cross and the empty tomb, we pray that you would open our eyes to see this moment for what it is, to see it as a time of preparation a time of repentance. Draw us close to yourself, Lord, and strengthen us with your word and your promises. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. We continue now with an opportunity for us to hear and even speak God's word. We will do that with words from Psalm chapter 31. And a quick note on this psalm, earlier on in the psalm are words that Jesus quotes as he's hanging on the cross. So keep that in mind as we say these words from Psalm 31 verses 9 through 16. I invite you to say them together with me. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Friends, we now enter a moment of confession and absolution bringing before the throne of our God all of our sins, our failures, the broken parts of us, asking God to forgive us all those things, to make us new. And the amazing thing about our God is that when we confess to him, he is faithful to us and pronounces us forgiven. So as we confess, this day, we will speak some words responsively. You'll see them on the screen. I will speak the the words that are, are printed normally, and I would invite you to speak the words that are bolded and underlined. 
Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Dear friend, our Lord hears your confession and receives it and now offers something for you to receive his word of forgiveness. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son Jesus to die for you, for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. And I, as his servant, declare the grace and the goodness of God to you and announce to you this day your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now hear God's word from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 9. This will serve as the basis for our reflection. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Friends, I'm struck by a character in this story. She's an anonymous character. Mark's gospel account doesn't mention her name at all. She appears simply for this story. But you know what? Jesus is so bold as to say that wherever this gospel, this good news about Jesus is proclaimed in the whole world, what this anonymous woman has done will be told in her memory. This is a remarkable little account. Jesus and his disciples are making their way toward Jerusalem, making their way toward the cross. The official time stamp is two days before the Passover. So presumably this is three days before Jesus is going to be crucified. They're in the house of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, 
and in walks a woman. A woman who serves as a, a kind of compass for the disciples of Jesus. Someone to point them in the right direction, to lead them somewhere they cannot see yet. This woman comes in with an alabaster flask of ointment, of perfume. And we're told that it is very costly. This perfume could have been sold for 300 denarii, nearly a year's worth of wages. The woman comes with the perfume, breaks the flask, and pours it on the head of Jesus. Jesus' disciples look at this and begin to scold the woman. And they ask themselves the question, why is she doing this? Couldn't this perfume have been sold and given to the poor? Isn't there a ton of good we could have done with the proceeds coming from the sale of something so valuable as this? And on the one hand, they're right. There is a lot of good that could have been done with the proceeds from a sale like that. But Jesus, Jesus tells them to leave the woman alone and to leave even their good ideas alone. Because you see, this woman has the best idea. She has prioritized the best thing in this scenario. She has prioritized Jesus. Jesus' disciples weren't able to see it. They were blind to the realities that were coming for Jesus and for themselves just a few days later. And Jesus says, consider what this woman has done and look to her as a kind of compass, as someone to reorient you, specifically to reorient your priorities, to see what truly matters, to see what is most important in this scenario. Friends, you are making your way toward the cross and the empty tomb. It is not far away. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, all of those events are in the near future. Look to the woman in this story, this anonymous woman, and see her as a kind of compass. And consider your own priorities. Consider even the things you believe to be good things in your life. And for a moment, stack them up next to the most important thing, the best thing. And devote your heart to Jesus. The woman in this story gave the most valuable thing she had to Jesus, an expression of devotion to the nth degree. And my encouragement to you, friends, is to consider how you might devote yourself to Jesus in the next week, week and a half, and express to him your faith, your trust in him. Set him as a priority, friends, because he is indeed the best thing you could ever possibly dream of having. His burial is not far away. His death is approaching, which means his resurrection is also approaching. Friends, you have, you have a Savior who has given his everything in devotion to you. He laid down his life. It was broken so that, 
so that the wonderful gifts of God might be poured on your own head, so that you might be, be covered in the beautiful fragrance of your Lord and Savior. You have that gift. As you go through the, the next week, week and a half, consider how you might devote yourself to the one who gave his everything for you. Amen. We now enter a time of prayer. As we pray, I will offer a handful of petitions and then there will be some time and some space for you to offer up those requests and those petitions on your own heart today. And after we take that time, we will conclude by praying the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given your Son, Jesus, to be the world's Savior. Help us not to lose sight of just how marvelous those truths are. Form us and shape us as we move through this week of Lent and as we enter Holy Week next week. Make the, make the stories, the accounts of your son's passion and death and resurrection sink into our hearts and minds. Bless us, Lord, as we worship you, as we receive your gifts, and send us into the world as a people who bear witness to your truth and your grace, and make us a people who live a a peculiar kind of way that the world might take notice and ask us what makes us the way we are and give us the courage to speak, to speak about you who guides us and leads us. Lord, we lift up to you today all those in, in need. We remember the, the sick the injured, the hospitalized. We lift up to you those who are poor. We lift up to you the unemployed and the underemployed. We lift up to you those who are afflicted in mind and heart, those battling anxiety, those who are depressed. We remember those who are stricken with grief, those who mourn the deaths of loved ones. For all of these individuals in their time of need, Lord, we pray that you would tend to them with your loving care and that you would supply them with everything uh, according to your will that is best for them. Lord, we also lift up to you your church asking that you would make your people even bolder to declare the wonders of your love and the depth of your sacrifice. Call to yourself people who have never heard the good news of your son before and bring back to yourself those who have strayed and work in us that we might go and reach them. Lord, we now take an opportunity to lift up to you all the prayers on our hearts and minds in this moment. Hear us, O Lord, and respond as is best for us. We commit all of this 
to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as we go, we go with God's blessing, his good word spoken over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.